John Cameron Swayze. Huntley. David Brinson. Protecting the troops, the wave of killing continues in Iraq while on Capitol Hill, top generals get grilled about why more isn't being done to protect the lives of Americans. High stakes. Exit polls tonight show America's biggest ally, Tony Blair, appears to be headed for a victory, but his power may be vastly reduced. Junk. That's now the credit rating for two American giants, GM and Ford. What does it mean and how did it come to this? And family secrets. This couple's miraculous story of survival untold for years, but now brought back to life. NBC News World Headquarters in New York. This is NBC Nightly News with Brian Williams. Good evening. Once again tonight, the question that has haunted the planners of the war in Iraq is back. Why isn't there enough armor to fully protect all the American soldiers fighting in that war? It came up today on Capitol Hill and at a crucial time of heavy insurgent violence in Iraq. There were four attacks by insurgents in Baghdad today. At least 26 people killed, 19 wounded. The targets included Iraqi police on patrol. And in the single most deadly attack, a young man strapped grenades to his body and blew himself up at a recruiting center for the Iraqi army. That brings us to today's hearing in Washington and the questions about a lack of protection for American soldiers. We begin here tonight with NBC's Jim McLeishevsky at the Pentagon. Please, Brian. Jim McLeishevsky at the Pentagon tonight, thanks. We know more tonight about the moments before and after the capture of that suspected number three man in Al-Qaeda this week. U.S. officials tell NBC News Abu Faraj al-Libi was carrying a notebook when he was caught and apparently tried to tear up the notebook. Investigators are currently studying the contents and interrogating Abu Faraj. They're focusing on two questions, the location of Osama bin Laden and any future al-Qaeda plans. The officials say, however, the interrogation process is moving slowly. Back in this country, there is news tonight that has to be discouraging to two of America's iconic brand name companies, General Motors and Ford Motor Company. Both had their credit ratings downgraded today by Standard & Poor's to the level known in the trade as junk. Wall Street didn't like it. Shares of both companies fell on that news. And the question tonight is, what does it all mean for the car companies and for car buyers? NBC News Chief Financial Correspondent Ann Thompson has been watching all of this today from California. And good evening. Good evening, Brian. In downgrading the credit ratings of the nation's two largest automakers, Standard & Poor's said it doesn't see how GM and Ford are going to get themselves out of their current sales rut. Both companies are losing market share, and both are losing sales in two key profit centers, SUVs and full-size pickup trucks. In cutting the rating, S&P said, look, we're seeing both companies lose sales in mid-size and full-size SUVs, not just because of gas prices. Prices, but because there is more competition out there, more manufacturing ma manufacturers are offering these very profitable vehicles. And in full-size pickup trucks, S&P specifically pointed to the powerhouse Toyota that will be offering its own full-size pickup truck in the next two years. All of this points to tough times for Detroit. Brian? And, and what about reaction here both on Wall Street and in the showrooms? Well, practically what this means on Wall Street for Ford and GM is that it's going to cost them more to raise money. But GM, even though it lost more than a billion dollars to start the year, has some $18 billion in cash on its books. So it's got cash to go along for a while. But S&P said today, even if it does have all this cash, it cannot endure financial bad times forever. As for what will happen in the showrooms, one analyst said today that this is today's decision is not going to have much impact on the average car buyer. Our chief financial correspondent, Ann Thompson, and thanks. As for the rest of Wall Street, the Dow dropped a little more than 44 points today. The Nasdaq was down less than a point. This is election night in Great Britain, and it appears the man who may be America's very best friend in the world, Prime Minister Tony Blair, is headed for a third term. But tonight, there's some question about what may happen after that. NBC News correspondent Jim Maceda is in London with the latest for us tonight. Jim, good evening. 
Brian, ballots are still being counted, but uh, initial exit polls, and again, these are just exit polls, and they've been highly erratic at times. They're saying that the Labor Party would win this election, but would lose dozens of seats. If that turns out to be the case, it would be a major blow to Prime Minister Tony Blair. In his trademark American style, important than exit polls, Brian, observers say a key indicator to watch for tonight is voter turnout. If it's high, Labor and Blair could benefit, but Blair has always said that voter apathy is his biggest enemy. We'll have to wait and see to see if that turns out to be the case or not. Brian? Jim Maceda watching the returns in London tonight. Jim, thanks. Up next this Thursday night, NBC News In-Depth. The hunt for Osama bin Laden. Tom Brokaw travels deep into enemy territory with U.S. Special Forces to find out what's really going on. And later, a family story that took 60 years to come out. NBC News in depth tonight. More on the war on terrorism. For the last two days in Afghanistan, American and Afghan forces have been fighting intensely with militants tied to the outlawed Taliban. It's been going on in two southern provinces. It's described as the deadliest fighting there in almost a year. More than 60 rebels and at least nine Afghan soldiers have been killed, seven Americans wounded. Tom Brokaw has just returned from a remote and hostile part of southern Afghanistan with an American special forces team. This is the U.S. Army's version of a wagon train trying to tame the frontier of southeastern Afghanistan. It is a joint patrol of American Special Forces and the new Afghan National Army, which has grown to 32,000 troops, almost twice as large as the American military presence in this country. They're hoping to bring peace and win friends in the village of Bagh, a tiny, impoverished collection of mud homes and simple shops. For security reasons, we can't show the faces of Commander Captain Colby Jenkins and members of his Special Forces team who have been working in this area for seven months. Today, Captain Jenkins lets his Afghan counterpart, Captain Ramatula, take the lead. This is a Jirga kind of town meeting as the Special Forces continue their dialogue with these men, winning their hearts and minds because just north of here, about two hours, is a major Taliban region and they want to keep this part of the pass secure. With the children looking on and the women of the village out of sight, the elders, all men, are friendly but wary. Almost all of them voted in the historic presidential election last fall, but like voters everywhere, they're impatient for more help. The first thing we need is food. We're hungry. We also don't have roads or a bridge. We also don't have clinics or schools. The Americans are eager to make these men happy because they expect the Taliban will be back in greater numbers this summer trying to disrupt the parliamentary election scheduled for the fall. Back in Kabul, well, well, Lieutenant General David Barno, the, the overall commander of American forces, forces we, we is wrapping up his tour after 18 months, really the, confident the that Afghanistan is soldiers. more secure and that Osama bin Laden's influence has been greatly diminished. Uh, he certainly is a symbolic leader out there, but I think he is so isolated that uh, he does not have the ability to control things on a daily basis, certainly, and, and has a limited amount of effect uh, overall. Barno has been spending more time on the border working with the Pakistan army. But Americans still cannot physically operate in Pakistan territory. It would touch off more anti-Americanism. Pakistan's president, General Pervez Musharraf. I think presence of any foreign troops is not looked uh, very favorably in Pakistan. The Pakistani army has had a good week, capturing the top al-Qaeda operative, Abu Faraj al-Libi, with the help of American intelligence, which is constantly tracking the Taliban and al-Qaeda along the border. Military commanders on the ground and at the highest levels were telling me that there's just a lot more Taliban activity now in Afghanistan again, and much of it comes from across the border from your country into Afghanistan. I know that there is some bad-mouthing on this uh, from the Afghan side, which should not be, uh, and I've made this very clear, please don't do this. I think we shouldn't blame each other. Things are going well. Back in Afghanistan, in the wild, Captain Jenkins and his Special Forces team return to their base, winding through the broad, scenic river valley where nothing seems amiss. When you look out on this valley, to me, it just seems peaceful and pastoral. What does it look like to you? Uh, pretty much the same, but with a lot of uh, hidden mysteries, a lot of history, a lot of uh, people struggling to uh, progress. 
And by the way, just two days after Tom's visit, Captain Jenkins and his men were helicoptered to another special forces base where they were involved in a major firefight attacking a regional headquarters. When we come back, who was she? The little girl whose death was a long mystery. Tonight, she has a name and the police have suspects. Here in New York tonight, the FBI and local police are still trying to figure out who's responsible for two makeshift grenade explosions early this morning outside an office building housing the British consulate. The blast caused minor damage, no injuries, and tonight police say they're not sure whether the consulate was a target or not. It has been four years since a gruesome discovery, the body of a little girl in Kansas City, Missouri. Authorities have no idea who the girl was. They called her simply Precious Doe. That is until today when they identified her and made two arrests. NBC's Mark Potter has more on how police say they finally cracked an awful case. Years after her death, she was known for NBC News, Chicago. And up next here, memories that were locked up for 60 years now coming to light thanks to an extraordinary piece of videotape. NBC Nightly News with Brian Williams. Brought to you in part by Aflac. Ask about it at work. If for today, this family got treated to a scrumptious surprise. What's next? There's a lot of good stuff, too. Watch tomorrow on Today, where dreams come true. MSNBC.com. We've always had free video with headlines at your fingertips. Watch it while you work and feel the power of NBC News online. MSNBC.com. Today is Yom HaShoah, Holocaust Remembrance Day around the world. This year marks the 60th anniversary of the liberation of the concentration camps. Just as there has been a race underway to record the memories of the GIs of the greatest generation, the same is true of the survivors of the Holocaust. A new documentary called A is for Auschwitz has been endorsed by Amnesty International and selected for several film festivals for the way it tells the story of what happened in the Holocaust. <laughs> At the NBC TV station in Detroit, and while... It Rita's grandson, filmmaker Zach Smilovitz, has now turned all of 18 and is headed to the University of Michigan. All of us who know him and the family are justifiably proud of this effort. If you'd like to see his documentary, A is for Auschwitz, in its entirety, you can do so on our website, nightly.msnbc.com. That is our broadcast for this Thursday night, the fifth day of May, 5-5 of 05. I'm Brian Williams. We'll look for you right back here tomorrow evening. Good night.